Only one player in the history of Major League Baseball has caught two perfect games. His name is Ron Hassey, and I am beyond pleased to welcome him to the Dennis Maniloff Show. Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Dennis, for inviting me. No problem. We are having Ron Hassey on to talk primarily about the first of his two perfect games caught, May 15th, 1981 at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. Right-hander Len Barker was on the mound for the Indians, opposing the Toronto Blue Jays and right-hander Louis Leal. Ron, before we get into the events of that day, I must ask you, are you surprised that there have been just 23 perfect games, 21 in the World Series era, in the history of the game? No, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, it's not easy to be able to throw a perfect game. You got to be, uh, you know, you got to be on that night, and uh, you got to have your uh, your game plan uh, against each hitter, and you got to be able to execute it. And that's not easy to do. Incredibly rare. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, really remarkably rare. Okay, as we look back at May 15, 1981, when did the preparation begin for you? where Lenny's start was concerned? Right after batting practice, we sit down uh, with Dave Duncan and go over the uh, opposing hitters. And we would talk about their weak uh, weaknesses and their strengths. And then we would talk about Lenny's strengths and what we were going to do and how we we're going to get ahead and how we we're going to put them away. That's up to Lenny to be able to execute his pitches that night. There's a lot of preparation going in into the game. It's it's not me just putting down fingers. It's it's there's a reason why I'm calling a certain pitch to a certain hitter, and and then it goes to the next hitter, and on and on and on like that. Is it incumbent upon you as the guy who's going to be calling the pitches? You have to almost memorize all these hitters and and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Is that correct? Yes, and and, and again, it, that's not that that's not the tough part. Uh, it's being able to get Lenny to be able to, to uh, execute his pitches. We know what we want to do going into the game. We have charts, how we're going to defend them. What, you know, if they're a, a first ball, fastball hitter, things like that. So, you know, going into the game, you're pretty well prepared. You're not going to be putting just fingers down and guessing and hoping. And, and if you are, you're, you're probably not going to be playing in the next game. <laughs> this was before the extensive use of video. Nowadays, they've got, you know, DVDs and all sorts of stuff uh, that they pop in. Did you have much video to work off of or how did the how did the Duncan meeting go? Was it based just strictly off of scouting reports written? No, this is uh, Dave Duncan was way ahead of his time. He, he had all kinds of charts that he would chart himself. Uh, we had video. We could you know, we we, we had hitters uh, that we could see. Uh, on a on TV screen and watch how they approach the pitcher. We saw location of the pitch and we sat down and then uh, they would have charts on, uh, on their opposing hitters. And uh, it might have uh, Lenny Barker, 20 at bats uh, with uh, Ernie Witt. And we knew exactly what Ernie Witt did against Lenny Barker. And what were the pitches that we got him out on? What was the count? Uh, what was the situation and so forth. And, of course, Dave Duncan, the pitching coach of the Indians. So you have the meeting uh, before the game to go over the hitters. The weather, not favorable, uh, 49 degrees Fahrenheit is what I was uh, reading when I looked at the various box scores. And the attendance, we know 700,000 people were there, but it, it was a uh, – they, they say they were there, but it's actually uh, 7,290 was the announced crowd. I, it's, I'm not so much interested in the crowd as I am the weather, uh, given that it was 49 degrees and there was a mist that appeared to be falling. I watched it on TV. Tell us what the weather was like that night and how much, if any, factor did it play in what you were going to call? Uh, well, it was, it was like a little misty night, a little drizzle here and there, very cold. Really, it's not going to change the way I'm going to call a ball game. The only way I'm going to change is if Lenny was not able to be able to use the type of pitches that he wanted to use that night, or he was just inconsistent with some of his pitches. That was not the case. Probably the weather kind of worked in our favor. But overall, the the weather really didn't come into play that much. Ron, when um, 
when we talk about Len Barker's pitch mix, uh, specifically on that night, I mean, of course he has the fastball. The breaking pitch, what did you guys call it? Was it a slider or was it a curve? It was a curveball. Okay. It looked like a curve to me, and then I see it referred to as a slider in various places, and I was like, no, nah, that, that's got a bigger <laughs> – a bigger bend than a, than a slider to me. Yeah, it was like more of a top-to-bottom type curveball. When I look at these numbers, they're mind-blowing, and we'll, we'll get into some of the individual at-bats in a second, but uh, 103 pitches, 84 of which were strikes. Um, we know the 11 strikeouts all swinging, didn't strike a batter out until the fourth inning, primarily using the fastball and the curve was there was there a change up in there at all or was it a strictly two pitch mix it was pretty much a two pitch mix uh, fastball curveball once in a while we might have thrown in there a change up just to keep the hitter off balance a little bit but uh, I don't recall actually right now remembering that was a long time ago that if we did use a change up uh, it was not very much maybe five or six pitches if that you got to remember, Lenny Barker, six foot six, standing on that mound. He looks like he's right on top of you. Lenny never had the type of control that uh, you felt comfortable in the batter's box. All right, so the bullpen session, as, as Lenny's getting ready, are you catching that one or um, was somebody else catching it? Somebody else is warming up. I'll go down there probably the last five to ten minutes. Just depends on uh, how I feel. But probably the last five minutes, I'm going to be down there uh, catching and warming up with him. And what did you see in that bullpen right before the game started? Well, typical Lenny, a little bit, a little all over the place. Did show a little, a, a pretty good curveball. But uh, like I said, uh, you know, for Lenny to be able to throw a perfect game, he had to be on all his pitches because Lenny was a little wild. You know, it was hard for me to believe that we never walked anybody in that ball game. But uh, you know, he 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 could he could drill somebody in a second. Not on you know, not trying to just accidentally hit somebody. But you know, he, he probably uh, I I don't know his stats, but maybe four or five, maybe six walks a game. Lenny was good for. All right, so the the game starts uh, top of the first. Alfredo Griffin. A chopper, if I recall, over the mound. And it, it seemed to me like a close play right out of the gate. Tommy Verizer had to make the play. Uh, how do you remember that one? Do you remember that first batter, Alfredo Griffin? Yeah, I, I you know, he, he hit, like you said, it was kind of a high chopper or over his, uh, over the mound. Tommy made it look like an easy play, got the guy. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a close play, but he was out. No question about it. I was just thinking about how this perfect game, you know, the, the start of it, the first batter, Griffin with speed and a chopper had a chance and uh, Verizer threw him out. Then Lloyd Mosby grounds out to short and George Bell, future uh, AL MVP, grounds out to, to Mike Hargrove at first. All right, so the first inning ends, uh, you know, you're not thinking perfect game at this point, but you you had to like what you saw. And was there anything that you adjusted after the first inning? No, there was no adjustments at all. He uh, actually, uh, he came out throwing strikes. And uh, I think we used a little bit of the breaking ball in that situation, uh, but mostly it was fastballs. Bottom of the first inning, you get a two-out RBI single that puts the Indians up two to nothing. So now you've got uh, some breathing room right out of the gate. It's a, it's a two-nothing game. Did you ever have the score affect how you called a game? No, not really. I wasn't really, you know, if a score was two zip or one zip or whatever, I wasn't going to change the game plan of what we talked about in the meeting. Uh, it was just if Lenny was not able to execute those pitches, then we would have to make the, the changes. But he was able to get ahead of the hitters, and that's one of the big things is getting ahead of the hitters. So. Uh, we just continued with the game plan. Uh, wasn't much talking about what, you know, in between innings either because we were we were getting outs. I was going to ask you that. What if any discussion was going on? Well, second inning, John Mayberry flies out. Willie Upshaw grounded out. Damaso Garcia put a charge into one. Uh, Rick Manning ran it down and left center. 
Uh, he would say it was routine, but that was uh, worth noting that, you know, he had to move to get that one. Third inning, Rick Pacetti ground sh- grounded a short. Danny Ainge, future NBA uh, player and executive, grounded a second. And Buck Martinez flied out to center. So nine up, nine down, uh, first time through. You like what you see. Everything is uh, going according to plan. Is that correct? Right. There was nothing to, to change, uh, not even really to, to discuss on the bench. Uh, as long as we're getting outs, uh, you know, the biggest thing, again, we're getting ahead of the hitters. So once we got ahead of the hitters, we were able to use that breaking ball a lot more. And in a couple of, in that maybe uh, one or two of the hitters in the second or third inning, we might have started them off with the breaking ball and got ahead with it and then went back to the fastball. Fourth inning, Griffin flies out to left, and then the strikeouts begin. Lloyd Mosby, first of the night, and then George Bell. Did you – I mean, of course you realized it, but were you surprised that Lenny had not struck a batter out until Mosby, the second batter of the fourth? Going through the inning the way we did, and uh, I think what's happening now about the fourth, fifth, sixth innings, they're starting to realize that Lenny's breaking ball was very difficult for them to handle. And now they have to worry about his fastball, which, you know, Lenny was probably around 94, 95 with his fastball. So now we have two pitches that both, uh, they, I mean, the hitter has to uh, kind of look for. They can't just sit on his fastball knowing that he can't get his breaking ball over for strikes. Fifth inning, Mayberry strikes out. Upshaw foul pop out to third. That's where Toby Hara leaned in to the stands to make the uh, excellent catch. And then Garcia strikes out. Sixth inning, Bassetti ground out to Kipe. Uh, Dwayne Kuyper makes an excellent play, ranging to his right. Then Danny Ainge strikes out, and Buck Martinez strikes out. So that's nine up, nine down, second time through. When did you start to say to yourself, we got a perfect game going here? No, there was no <laughs> – don't forget the score was what, two zip? Yeah, it was. I think it was still two nothing. Yeah, it was still a close ball game. Not thinking anything like that at all. Uh, just trying to figure out how are we going to stay ahead and get ahead of the hitters. What pitch should we actually use? Uh, and at that point, uh, probably around the sixth, seventh inning, really, it's probably about the fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth. I wasn't really worried about his control. He pretty much had it under control himself. Uh, we were able to use the breaking ball. The good thing about his breaking ball was it started off in the strike zone and it ended up in the dirt. So it really made it very difficult for the hitter. Anything in terms of uh, Lenny beginning to be by himself in the dugout? I mean, what was normal procedure versus May 15, 1981? Did did guys stay away from him at a certain point? No, I don't think so. Lenny didn't really have a whole lot to say anyway but during ball games, but we were just uh, – you know, again, two zip, close game. Just really, there was no conversation at all. Uh, we were just, you know, when you're having success like that and you're getting hitters out, you're just going to stay with the program. It was 2 nothing from the bottom of the first all the way through to the eighth, and that's when the uh, Indians scored their final run to make it 3 nothing. That was the final score. Louis Leal pitched a complete game for the uh, Blue Jays. All right, seventh inning, Griffin grounds out to Kite. Kite makes another quality play, ranging to his left. This was a bang-bang play. And then Mosby strikes out, Bell strikes out. Eighth inning, Mayberry strikes out, Upshaw grounds out to second, and Garcia strikes out. Anything in the seventh and eighth that jumps out at you, how things were going? No, I think uh, probably seventh and eighth, we used probably a little bit more curveballs than we did fastballs. We were still getting ahead of the hitters. We still got them chasing after the breaking ball. And as they were looking for the breaking ball, Lenny was able to, you know, get the fastball by him. Was there any ball that was hit up to this point through eight innings where you thought, okay, maybe this is going to be a knock? Yeah, the ball that uh, Kuiper made on uh, Griffey. I think that was the closest play of them all, of all in the whole game. Yeah, he had to go to his left in, uh, in the hall, and, and yes, it was a bang-bang play. You never visited Lenny on the mound the entire game, right? There was no reason to. No, I, I, don't, I don't even recall going out there saying anything to Lenny or even giving him a rest. Didn't really need to. Like, you, you know, nine innings, what, it was 103 pitches? 103. As a catcher, are you 
worry that you might overthink it a little bit. You might put down the wrong finger in a case like that. Are, are you ever thinking, oh, man, I can't second guess myself in this situation? No, I was well programmed, like I said, before the game even started. The way Dave Duncan did his meetings uh, and go over every hitter, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. It's no guessing. There was no guessing out there at all. This is how you do it. This is how we know these are the pitches that can get these hitters out. The only thing we had to do was make sure that we were ahead in the count. And that's what Lenny did. He got ahead in the count with his fastball or his breaking ball, kept the hitters off balance with that breaking ball, and he was able to throw strikes. To your point, Ron, no three ball counts the entire game, which is re another remarkable stat. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, no three ball counts from a guy who had wildness issues, uh, but not on this night. The ninth inning, Bassetti foul pop to Toby Hera, and then pinch hitter Al Woods for Ainge uh, strikes out. And before we get to Ernie Witt pinch hitting for Buck Martinez, the final batter, when when Woods comes up, do you what did you do there as far as the scouting report? Because now you know, all right, I'm sitting on a perfect game with my pitcher for eight and a third. Now I got a pinch hitter. What did you have to process in terms of what Al Woods might be able to do? Well, there was again, there was really didn't have to process anything. We knew what his strengths and weaknesses were. We went over him in the meeting. Uh, we just don't go over just the nine hitters that are playing that night. We go over the bench and everybody that might have a possibility of getting in the game. So it was no no surprise that he came up to pinch hit. Actually, we were kind of expecting it that Danny Ainge would get pinched hit for. Uh, the only thing that kind of worried me about Danny Ainge is that he might bunt for a base hit. He wasn't known for a great being a, a, a solid type major league hitter, but the back of my mind, there was a chance that he could bunt. All right, Ernie Witt pinch hitting for Buck Martinez, uh, the 27th batter. I was worried there. That was probably the biggest time, the, the most I was worried in the game because Ernie Witt's a good hitter, and he's a left-handed hitter. I rather have seen Buck Martinez up there batting right-handed against uh, Lenny, but Ernie Witt coming up, uh, he's got power. He makes good, solid contact. I think we started him off maybe with a fastball, kind of maybe finished him off with the with a curveball that he – flew out to center field. Yeah, so I was going to say, the last pitch looked to me like a curveball. And it, that was the other, that was the breaking pitch. It couldn't have been a change up or anything like that. It was a curveball, right? I mean, that's how you remember it. Yeah, it's a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure. I just know Ernie Wood coming up in that situation. And uh, I knew that we had to get ahead of, uh, of him and, and try to keep him off balance. And I'm pretty sure it was a breaking ball that we got him out in. You and Lenny never, because I was a, a kid, you know, and as an Indians fan in the '80s, watching you, you guys, and Verizer and Kipe and everybody. But you and Lenny struck me as even keeled. You weren't going to get rattled in moments like this. But how nervous were you as the game went on? How nervous were you for Lenny? And did you sense that Lenny was nervous? No, you know, I never, you know, I didn't sense that out of Lenny. You know, like I said, probably not a lot of contact going on during the uh, in-between innings with Lenny, just for the fact is we, uh, we, were, we were getting the hitters out and what we were trying to do. Uh, we were sticking with the game plan. Tell you the honest truth, I didn't even know it was a perfect game at the end. I figured we had to walk somebody. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. We're talking with Ron Hassey, who caught Len Barker's perfect game on May 15th, 1981 when the Indians beat the Toronto Blue Jays at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. We'll be back in a few moments. Hey, everybody. I'm Gary. And I'm Jason. Opening cards as a kid, no matter what was in the pack, you always had that stick of chewing gum. Well, it turns out Gary and I opened up a box of 86 tops last year, and let me tell you, the chewing gum does not age well. Join us on the Ball Card Show, the sports podcast for the sports collector. Hi, my name is Sam Post, owner of Phenomwell CBD Store and PhenomwellCBD.com. That's like phenomenal, phenom, well, 
CBD.com. Tune in where we talk with experts about how the amazing hemp plant can make a difference for people's health and well-being from the Press Play Podcast Network. Coming up on the next edition of the Reg Eye and Rota podcast, thank God, Reg, the Cavalier season is over. We'll recap what was yet another miserable year. The postmortem on, I don't know, I hope <laughs> not, but what might be a 50-loss season in a 72-game shortened schedule. Kenny, something's got to give this offseason. I'm going to leave it right there. I hear you loud and clear. We'll talk about that. And the Indians, maybe the tribe has a shot at this crazy, wacky American League Central Division. We'll talk about that and some Browns chatter as well on the next edition of the R&R Podcast. Welcome back to the Dennis Maniloff Show. My guest is Ron Hasse. He caught Len Barker's perfect game on May 15, 1981. And we are at the point where Ernie Witt hits the fly ball to center field. Rick Manning is there. He catches it, a perfect game for Lenny Barker. And once the ball's caught by Manning, what do you do? You just run out to Lenny and, and start hugging him? Is that the whole deal? Pretty much. I've never, ha- I've never had to do it before, so I've never caught a, a perfect game or a no-hitter. So, yeah, we just all ran to Lenny. And that was pretty much it. And uh... – Walked off the field and uh, to that 75,000 people in the stands. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but... Right. Exactly. A sellout 50 times over for how many people showed up uh, over the years. Uh, but now in the clubhouse after the game, uh, what was it like in there? I mean, it, it, we heard about the the champagne and the, uh, what, a rolled out a red carpet for Lenny because he was detained in the dugout. I know Bruce Drennan was talking to him. Uh, was he one of the last guys, if not the last guy, to come through the tunnel? I remember Lenny coming in at the end. And, yeah, he was probably the last guy because of doing the interviews out in the uh, dugout. After that, I can't remember much more. Uh, I just remember Lenny coming in the locker room. I think there was uh, some bottles of beer that was poured on him, and and that was pretty much it. Did he thank you? I mean, like, say, Ron, thank you, man. This was This was quite a game. I mean – do you have, did you have any conversation afterwards where you just, you, he just said, I can't believe what I just did? A little bit, but uh, Lenny was very generous. He did write me a check, uh, <laughs> which I was very pleased to receive. Since that was my, probably my second year in the big leagues and <laughs> did help out. When you were able to like wake up the next day and you have, obviously you guys got games to play, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, you can't sit and bask in it, even though this, this was kind of a crazy year, 81 with the strike and everything. But as the season rolled on, was there any more appreciation for what you had accomplished on that night? You know, it's just like that game's over with and we move on to the next game. And so the, the process starts all over again. After batting practice, we sit down with Dave Duncan, go over the opposing hitters, go over who our, our pitcher is going to be that night. We start all over again. And, Ron, um, it would have been one thing if you caught one perfect game, but you have, you are the man when it comes to MLB catchers because, as I said at the top of the show, the only catcher in Major League Baseball history – to catch two perfect games. We fast forward to July 28th of 1991, Dennis Martinez, perfect game against the Dodgers. You and Dennis were battery mates for the Expos. This one is in LA, correct? Yes, day game. Um, and just just summarize that game, uh, how exciting that was. And did anything that you had done 10 years earlier with Lenny all of a sudden seep into your mind as that game was rolling on? No, no question. I really enjoyed this game, uh, probably from the seventh inning on. Actually, I even told the uh, pitching coach, uh, we got something special going tonight. Sit back and watch it, and I'm going to enjoy it. Starting off in the first inning with Dennis. Dennis is a completely different pitcher than Lenny. Dennis did not have the overpowering fastball that he can get away with uh, on some mistakes. Uh, Dennis had to hit his spots. He had to keep the batter off balance. He had to work inside and outside. 
pretty much the same thing happened. We sat down before the game. I went over the, with him, the hitters, what we needed to do, how we were going to get ahead, what pitch are we going to be able to put them away with. That game uh, was uh, completely different than Lenny's game just because, like I said, Dennis Martinez was a control pitcher and Lenny was more of a hard-throwing uh, fastball type of pitcher that uh, could get away with mistakes. And you said you sensed, uh, again, when did you sense that Martinez had something special brewing? Well, around closer to around the seventh inning, uh, we were able to get through all the hitters pretty easily using his uh, breaking ball change up, using the fastball more just to uh, set up the other pitches. He was able to hit the, the locations that night. Very rarely did he miss a location. It was just one of those nights where he just really kept the hitter off balance. And now Dennis, he definitely has to keep the hitters off balance. He doesn't throw as hard as Lenny. But he had a slider and he has a curveball. He had all four pitches. Uh, we probably use more of the slider to the right-handers and the curveball more to the left-hand hitters. And we use the changeup uh, again just to keep them off balance. Yeah, th this was a fascinating game. I, I call up the box scores. I'm talking to you. And, I mean, your Expos lineup had some really nice pieces. Delano DeShields was leading off. Grissom was batting second. Davey Martinez, Yvonne Calderon, Tim Wallach, future Hall of Famer, Larry Walker, then you, then Spike Owen, and then Dennis Martinez. The Dodgers, I mean, almost a who's who in the early start of that lineup. Brett Butler, Juan Samuel, Eddie Murray, Daryl Strawberry, Cal Daniels, Lenny Harris, Mike Sosha, our old buddy Alfredo Griffin back again, and then uh, Mike Morgan, yeah, uh, was pitching and Morgan threw a complete game. So, well, wait a minute. Look at, I think it was probably fifth inning. That, did he have a shutout going in the fifth? Uh, you guys scored two in the seventh, and that was it. Two nothing final. He might have had a perfect game going in the fifth or something. Wow. Or no hitter. Wow, that's crazy. All yeah. right. Yeah. Cause he was, he was throwing, uh, putting up goose eggs until you guys got two across in the, uh, seventh and it looks like maybe walker had a home run because he was one for four with a rbi on a run and then dave martinez scored a run he was all for four but he had a run scored but yeah i mean the eddie murray daryl strawberry back to back that had to be a tough deal to navigate especially for a right hander who didn't overpower you right you know those two guys you just don't want to get in a situation where you have to throw a fastball. And I think what we did in, with both of those guys is we started them off with a breaking ball and got ahead with the breaking ball. And then again, we just showed them the fastball off the plate just to move them off the plate so we could open up the outside part of the plate. And we used the breaking balls on the outside part. And anytime we did throw a fastball, it was usually down and away. When I'm looking at the ancillaries to that box score, I see a Larry Walker triple. But I also see this. Do you remember that you were caught stealing in that game? <laughs> uh, no. I it's don't. amazing. It no. says caught stealing Hassey. <laughs> now, you did get a knock. So you, were, you had a knock in both perfect games in which you caught. You were one for three, but you were caught stealing. Yeah, they, they should fire the manager that, that put the steal sign on. <laughs> That's funny. That is funny. I mean – do you think that – I'm glad I saw this, too, as I was looking at the umpires. Going back to May 15, 1981, Davey Garcia is the umpire, and then Larry Poncino is the ump for the Dennis Martinez game. Any conversation at all with uh, either one of the plate umpires during the course of this game? Are, are they saying to you – is either one of them saying to you, hey, this is something else, uh, you know, or they have to maintain their objectivity so they don't say a word? No, they weren't talking about uh, of the game at all. Uh, both of those umpires are good umpires. They very consistent uh, on their calling balls and strikes. Uh, uh, no, we weren't even talking about uh, the pitcher, you know, having a possibility of a perfect game or no hitter, and, uh, nothing like that at all. And in your 
recollection. I mean, I watched the game. I watched Lenny's perfect game on Channel 43 with Joe Tate on the call. And, you know, my, my dad and my older brother and I were watching it in our living room and our family room. We switched between each inning. We went from the family room to the living room, back to the family room because we didn't want to mess up the, uh, the mojo. But when you think about that game and the Dennis Martinez perfect game, it looked like it moved really fast. Like those games were incredibly well played and well pitched. Did you feel like the umpires got it right on virtually every call? The, the two plate umpires? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, you know, there wasn't probably a pitch that I questioned at all, or I would have remembered it again. I think with in Lenny's game, he got ahead with that fastball and was able to use the breaking ball so effective, the umpires really didn't have to make a call. They were swinging and missing. And, and also with Dennis Martinez's case, too, we had a lot of ground balls, flyouts. Uh, I don't know in Martinez's game how many strikeouts we had, but uh, I don't think it was a, a large number. I've got him for five. Yeah, yeah five Ks. Number, uh, yeah, like I said, he was more of a control pitcher. We got a lot of ground balls, fly balls. Both games were quick games. Couldn't have been three hours. Long. Yeah, your uh, Lenny game was barely more than two hours. You know, we'll wrap with this, Ron, and thank you so much for joining us on, on the uh, the Dennis Maniloff podcast. Oh, by the way, two hours and 14 minutes for uh, the Dennis Martinez game. And I want to say it's all, it was like 210 for the Len Barker game. So almost identical in, in terms of time. Do you have any memorabilia from – either one or if not both of those uh, games? No, I do not. I got the catcher's glove. Did you use the same mitt for both games? No, no. It was 10 years apart. And actually, the, one of the catcher's glove is at Cooperstown. Oh, sweet. Do you know which one that is? Uh, it was the glove that uh, Lenny, the first one, first uh, perfect game. Wow. All right. So, Ron, when I say – Ron Hassey, the only major league catcher ever to catch two perfect games. What comes to your mind? Well, it, you know, what comes to my mind is all the preparation that we did before the game actually worked. And that's very satisfying to know that you spent an hour in that meeting room going over hitters and was able to execute. And again, I didn't have to execute. Lenny Barker had to do all the work. Dennis Martinez all had to do all the work. All I was with was was, uh, uh, was helping him get through a ball game. And that's by keeping what we discussed in the meetings and bringing that into the game. But those two guys had to uh, execute their pitches for us to be successful. Do you ever remember Lenny or Martinez shaking you off in either one of those games? Probably, I would have to say Dennis probably more than Lenny. Because I think Dennis tried to fool me and the hitter. Uh, it, <laughs> and because I had a discussion with, with Dennis Martinez, because I caught most of all Dennis Martinez games when I was in Montreal. And probably the first three or four games that I caught him, it seemed like every sign that I put down, he shook, shook me off. Finally, I said to him in between innings, are you, are you trying to fool me and the hitter? You know, I thought we went over the hitters. And that's the way he was, uh, you know. But as that, after that, we got on the same page and it was pretty easy catching him. Because you want to have a good relationship with your pitcher. It makes it a lot easier when you're behind the plate uh, and he knows that he can trust you calling a ball game. So it makes my job a lot easier. Ron Hassey, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, congratulations on those two amazing games in your career and uh, you should be all incredibly proud of that and thank you so much for uh, for being with us today well thank you very much for having me